Hello everybody. So, uh, as promised, I wanted to take some time and record the process of performing spectral matching. Um, and it's because all of you are going to have to do this for the homework assignment. We are going to be using spectral matching using the software SeismoMatch that you can download from seismosoft.com. It's a great piece of software, as you will soon see. Very user friendly, which is also one of its disadvantages because um, because it is so easy, it can be pretty easy to make some mistakes sometimes. So anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and analyze uh, a set of time histories from start to finish so that you guys can see the entire process. Now, uh, in an earlier video that I recorded live in front of the class, you saw how I selected time histories for um, uh, for, for time history scaling. Uh, and we used the uh, Peer NGA West 2 database to do that. So this lecture, this little supplemental lecture here, is going to demonstrate how I develop time histories using spectral matching. There's going to be a few similarities, as you'll see, but uh, there's also going to be some significant differences, too. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, what we need to do is we need to collect what I call some seed time histories. These are going to be the initial time histories we're going to start with and that we're going to use to um, in our spectral matching algorithm to come up with our time histories. Now in this particular instance um, for this demonstration I'm only going to spectrally match one time history but then you would see how the process would continue for other time histories, like if you had to do it for three, five, seven, or 20, however many time histories that, that you were trying to develop. So um, again, let's go ahead to the peer um, NGA West 2 database. Better connect to the internet first. I'm not sure why that's not connecting automatically. There we go. Try it again. Let's see. Now nah, let's just do this. Peer NGA West database. There we go. I'm not sure what other website that was that pulled up, but it seemed to be all the documentation about it. So um, while this is pulling up, again, we're going to be using the uh, conditional mean spectrum for our Salt Lake City homework problem that we used. Um, and that's going to be the, uh, the basis or our target spectrum for our spectral matching. Not exactly sure why the uh, website is taking so long. I wonder if um, you guys have crashed it by uh, all of you students hitting it up at the same time. I want to pause the lecture here for a minute while I try to figure this out. Okay, we're back. Uh, for some reason, it just took a really long time for that to upload. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why, but uh, it looks like the peer servers are a little bit slow this morning. hope that won't affect us too much. So like we did before with our time history scaling, we're going to go ahead and uh, put in our target spectrum. We're going to use a user-defined spectrum. Like we did last time, we're going to go and uh, use our CSV target spectrum. And I'm just going to upload that, and it tells me the file was uploaded successfully, so we should be good. And there's our target spectrum right there. So that's what we're going to try to match. Now, like before, like with scaling, we're going to go in and we're going to search records. But there's going to be a few key differences here. Um, the main difference is going to be we do not want to scale any of the time histories. We just want the time histories as they are. So let's go ahead, uh, because this is Salt Lake City, I'm interested in principally normal faults, but we don't have a huge selection of normal faults in these databases. So I'm going to add strike slip faults as well to them. Uh, for the Wasatch fault, 
I anticipate anything between, uh, we'll say 6 to a 7.5 magnitude earthquake. That'll be good for our RJB distance, 0 to 10 kilometers. 0 to 10 kilometers for our rupture distance as well. And again, depending on where your site is located relative to the fault, these numbers are going to change. Salt Lake City is right on top of the Wasatch Fault. And so that's why I have these relatively small uh, source to site distances. Our, uh, you'll recall that our site uh, had an average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters equal to 275 meters per second. So I'm going to put a bounding range of 200 to 300 meters per second on the shear wave velocity. Uh, for now, I'm going to say any record. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there. Maximum number of records, I don't really care. I'll just put 30. Um, now here it is. Initial scale factor. I want it to be one and one, max and min. I, I basically do not want the, the algorithm here to scale any of the time histories. And then I'm going to select um, an actual recorded time history component. I'll select H1, or you can do H2 if you want. But we don't, we don't want to do any of these average time histories uh, unless you want to go ahead and compute that average time history yourself. Okay, um, as far as our scaling method, we're going to do minimize mean square error. And again, um, for this particular instance, we're interested in the entire uh, response spectrum. So I'm going to go ahead and put um, 0 0.1 second to 4 second, and we're going to then do our 1 to 1. So what I'm saying in this box is I want to find the best fit across uh, the response spectrum from a period of 0 0.1 second to 4 seconds. So let's go ahead and search the records and see what we can find. Well, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I really think that the peer uh, database is having some issues this morning. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Uh, don't worry, I can have a backup plan here. Okay, anyway, what I would do is, if, if their database was working, I would go ahead and select a time history, two or two, however many I was looking for, and those would be my C time histories. Um, I have some, let's go ahead and... Restore a couple of these. I had some previous time histories. Um, there we go. So now, let's see, if I come into my folder I was dealing with, let's just say I downloaded these three time histories from the um, the peer website, okay? If I want to actually look at any of these time histories, I could go ahead and uh, let's see, open up the Seismos Signal program that, that we've already looked at. Let's have a look at them real quickly just to make sure that they look okay. So let me go to my folder here. Here are the three. I'll go ahead and just open up. I'm only going to look at one of them for the time being. Okay, so here's the format that we have. We have time on one, uh, on the first column. We have acceleration in the next column. So right off the bat, I'm going to select time and acceleration value per line. It looks like my first line starts at line two. My last line, if I scroll down, uh, my last line is line uh, 5,178. So, I mean, if I put 6,000 in there, it would be fine. It looks like my time step here is 0 0.005. I have an acceleration value every 0 0.005 seconds, and I'm going to leave my scaling factor at 1. Acceleration column is my second column, 
and my time column here is my first column. So let's go ahead and plot those. It's just telling me, hey, I reached the end of the file at line 5,179. Great. Here's what those time histories look like. Um, as I look at the displacement time histories, everything seems to circle around uh, a displacement of zero, which is what we're looking for. Uh, also with velocity, it looks like everything hovers around our velocity of zero. Uh, so I think those are pretty good. Let's go ahead and look at our response spectrum. I'll look at the acceleration response spectrum for 5% damping. And so you can see it has a PGA of about 0 0.37 Gs. It spikes at about 1. I don't know, 75 Gs at a period of two, three, maybe 0 0.3 seconds. So that's going to be the time history that we're going to go ahead and play with in our spectral matching uh, routine here. So I'm going to go ahead and close Seismo Signal um, for the time being. And let's go ahead and open up now um, the other program that we're going to use. It's called Seismo Match, made by the same developers of Seismo Signal. It looks like I have an update. I'm not going to worry about updating it right now. Now, uh, there's a couple of things I could do. I want to go ahead and demonstrate um, just one time history for the time being and go through all of that. And then I'm going to show how you could perform multiple matching at the same time. So uh, let's go ahead and open a, a single source accelerogram. So what that's saying is uh, give me this, the seed time history. So let's go ahead and find that. There it is. Going to open this up, and you're going to see an input box very similar to uh, the box that we just saw in Seismo Signal. So I can again change these parameters to be the same as they were in Seismo Signal. Everything looks okay. There we go. Okay, so now it's just going to plot our acceleration time history, though if I wanted to look at our time series uh, uh, by clicking on that tab, I could, or our response spectrum. We won't look at match spectrum yet because we haven't done any matching, but we will. Okay, so here's my one time history that's, that is in here as my, my seed or my source. Next, step two, I need to define a target spectrum. So in order to do this, I can either use um, a Euro code spectrum. So this comes, uh, you got to remember the developers uh, for the software are out of Great Britain. And so, of course, they're more interested in Euro code than they are of any of the U.S. code. So that's why Euro code is the main option there. Uh, we can use a spectrum from a loaded accelerogram. So if I wanted to match time histories to um, an actual time history, uh, response spectrum I could or I could just load a response spectrum from a file so if I click on this let's go to my file here time history demonstration matching time histories actually it was in this one okay so in this one um, I'm not going to open up the CSV file I'm going to open up the text file that had my target spectrum in it. And an input box similar to what we had before is going to pop up and it's going to say, all right, how do I interpret this text file? So here's how I wrote the text file. I have period of the response spectrum in the first column and I have the corresponding spectral acceleration in the second column. It looks like the first line of data begins on line four. So I'm going to say first line is line four. Last line says 200. My last line is actually 20, but if I leave it at 200, it's not going to do anything. I'm going to leave my scaling factor at 1. My period for my response spectrum is in my first column. That's correct. My acceleration is in my second column. So that looks good. So now I'm just going to click OK. It's going to tell me, hey, we reached the end of your line. Yeah, I know. Here is my target response spectrum. Cool. All right, so I'm going to hit OK. So then it has a little plot of my spectrum. 
Um, if I click on mean match spectrum, it's not showing anything yet. But if I click on response spectra, you can see now uh, the target spectrum compared with the actual time history spectrum, or at least the pre-matched time history spectrum. So you can see why I picked this time history is that for a, you know, a lot of this response spectrum, it seems to follow the general trend of the spectrum, but we're going to have to do something about these big deviations over here. So let's go ahead and we're going to perform some matching. So a couple of things we got to do, we've got to check the, um, the settings. Now I like to do a, um, I like to do a, a two-stage approach when I do spectral matching. I like to match the low period ground motions first, and then I like to match um, the whole rest of the spectrum. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to define that the minimum period for my spectral matching is going to be uh, 0 0.01. It's giving me a warning message, though. It says min matching period cannot be lower than minimum defined period. Not sure what that means. If I go up here to the settings, matching parameters, these are all the stuff that uh, are in the RSP match algorithm developed by um, Norm Abramson. Okay. Target PGA. What is our target PGA? Let me have a look at that real quick. Target PGA looks like about 0.39 or so. So let's make sure we've got that in there. Target PGA 0.39. Damping 0.1 number of cycles. OK, I think we're OK. Response spectra minimum period. There we go. I wonder if I, could ch if I change that to 0.01. That's still not going to work. Okay, let's change our minimum period to 0 0.02 seconds. Is it still not working? What if I did 0 0.03? What if I did 0 0.05? Minimum matching period cannot be lower than minimum defined period. Those if I do point 0.1. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to pause this for a second and figure out because I've got something screwy going on with my settings. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I think I figured out what's going on and why, uh, for some reason, I cleared my target spectrum. So let's go ahead and reopen and upload my target. I think that's what it was causing. Um, Oops, my video presentations, time history demonstration. There we go. I think that's what was causing the mistake there. Um, okay, all those should be good. There we go. Yeah, that's better. So um, I accidentally erased my target spectrum. That's why I was getting these error messages. Okay, so. What I did, just so you're aware, I went into response, uh, into the settings, I went into response spectra, I changed my minimum period to 0 0.01, and I changed my uh, matching parameters to 0 0.01 as well. And that shows up right here, that minimum period term. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to place um, one second there. So I'm going to match from 0 0.01 second on the response spectrum, so right here near the PGA, up to one second. So this is the curvy part of the response spectrum that we're going to be matching to. The rest of the response spectrum we're not going to worry about in the first run. Now, uh, I don't want any scaling factor in here, and this tolerance is um, pretty important. Now. The smaller the tolerance, the tighter spectra, uh, the seismal match is going to try to make your response spectrum fit the target, but it also is going to um, modify and change your acceleration the most as well. So you have to find kind of a balance between what is reasonable and what is going to be able to be accomplished by the software. 
Uh, I think that the default of 0.3 is a great option for the first um, run. So let's go ahead. I'm going to click now this button, do matching. And uh, that went really fast, uh, that, which is usually a good sign. What it's saying is, okay, I went through, processed the accelerogram, here's my total progress, and I was done. And if you see this, this message that says converged, that's a good thing. If it doesn't say converged, don't freak out. All it meant was it couldn't ever get within your tolerance of the uh, 30%. You can see right here, uh, my maximum misfit was 26%. So we're, we were good. All right, now if I go to time histories, you can see um, there's the original time histories. If I click on matched time histories, you can see that it's different. Okay, watch, watch the acceleration plot. Here's original, matched. Original, matched. Original, matched. You see the difference? Now watch velocity. Velocity, original, matched. Original, matched. So it's making some little changes. Watch displacement. Original, matched. Original, it's harder to see there. I can do a comparison and go ahead and plot the two on the same plot. And these types of comparison plots are really, really helpful. Um, because you can see as they're overlaid where you have deviations. Notice how all our peaks line up really well. And uh, so each peak is lined up with the pre-matching peak. The, the height of the peak is different, of course, but this is a really good match for our first uh, attempt. Let's go ahead and look at the response spectrum. So there is our original. Here's our matched. Look what happened now that the time history or the algorithm came in and it pulled our original uh, response spectrum down closer to the target within this range of 0 0.01 second to one second. We still have quite a flare right here and we're probably not going to be able to get rid of that. But, you know, uh, at least get rid of it while keeping a, a half decent realistic time history. But we're going to go ahead and uh, what we're going to do um, I want you now to go ahead and click File, and we're going to save the record time histories, okay? Let's see, where do I want to save this to? Um, let's go ahead and save it to um, our little folder here. Classes 545, time history demonstration. We're going to save it in match time histories. Let's save. I don't want data from the original accelerograms. I want data from the saved or saved data from the matched accelerograms. And then um, save all selected accelerograms. So if I was matching multiple, it would save them all at the same time. Or I could just do a specific if I wanted uh, just one. And it's going to save it in seismo signal format. So uh, it's going to be a two column data file with time and then acceleration. So let's go ahead and create files. So now if I open up my folder, there it is. Check it out. So now I have, it, it creates this file, and it's going to say matched Dutch FN. That means fault normal. Okay. So that's the file that got saved. What I like to do is I like to go ahead and change the name of this. Um, and the reason is because this algorithm is, is developed using some kind of a little old-fashioned coding where the name of your file is, is limited by... Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 characters. When we do a second round of matching and we save it, basically it's going to take whatever name we have and just put the name matched in front of it. So it's going to come out and it's going to say matched, matched, and then maybe we might get a D or something in there in our 15 characters. So I don't want that. What I want to do is I want to go ahead and change this to do Duce fault normal um, underscore. So I might say um, version one.
meaning that was our first version or our first iteration. So that's now what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go back into Seismo Match, and I am going to remove the selected. Yes, and I'm going to open now. Go into my folder. And I'm going to find that file. And it's saved as a text document, not a DAT file. So make sure that you select all files. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to see it. Go up here, and I'm going to select it now. And that's going to be my input file for my round two of spectral matching. So um, here we go. My time step, of course, is 0 0.05 seconds, as I mentioned before. My first line of data looks like it starts on line 6 this time. Uh, I don't want to scale anything. I have time and acceleration values per line, so I've got the right button selected up here. Acceleration is the second column. Time is the first column. Looks good. So now I'm just going to click, um, oh, I'm going to check the last line of data, 5,182. And this says 6,000, so it's greater than. We're OK. I'm going to click OK. There it is. So now it imported the output from the first round of matching. And this is going to be the C now that it's going to use. So let's go to our time histories. Let's look at our response spectra. So now you can see you know, here is our original input, original accelerogram. Let's go ahead now. And we're going to come down to our step two, and we're going to change our matching parameters from 0 0.01 second minimum to a maximum period of four seconds. Now we're going to go ahead and do the entire uh, response spectrum. I'm going to leave my tolerance at 0.3 for now. You know, if I wanted to lower it to something tighter, I could. Uh, but just for the sake of demonstration, I'll leave it to at 0.3. And I'm going to click OK. So here it goes. You're going to see it's taken longer now because it has to go through the entire response spectrum. But it's telling me that it gave me a solution. Maximum misfit is about 30%. My guess is it's going to be that flare on the top of the spectrum. That's OK. Let's go ahead and look at our time series. There's our original matched. Original matched. So remember, this original, or what's labeled as original, has already gone through modification once from the what, what was the actual original time history that we used. If I click on matched, it's modified it even more. So if I compare these time histories, you'll see um, there's a little bit of deviation now from um, the original and the match. But it's, it's actually really not too bad. Now here's the thing, a, a lot of students have made this mistake in the past and I don't want you to make this mistake. In the homework it asks you to compare the post matching with the pre matching time history in plots like this that are shown. This is going to require folks that you actually go to the table of data that you download or, or that you copy you know, um, this acceleration versus time Let's go ahead and scroll this down. Highlight all that, copy it, and take it over to Excel. And I want you to plot it yourself. And plots that are going to look like this. And, and you can't just let Seismo Match make the plots for you because what's going to happen is. Um, What's going to happen is it's what it's comparing is the first round of spectral matching with the second round of spectral matching. What I want you to compare is the original time history before any matching happened with the final round of spectral matching. So that's what these plots are going to look like. So you see I created a spreadsheet. I created my own plots. And so it's, it's creating then... Um, pre-matched time histories. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. There you go. So what it, it's doing for me is it's creating pre-matched time histories with 
post-match time histories. So, I mean, when you compare plots like this, you can see, wow, you know, maybe I really did kind of mess up that time history lot. Because if I'm looking at this acceleration record, that the peaks are all over the place. I really changed this time history record a lot. Same with velocity. The displacement doesn't look that bad, but velocity, I've got some new peaks. Stuff looks shifted around, um, offset, a little questionable. So that's what I expect you guys to do with your time histories, okay? Let's go back to seismo match. So um, I want to look at the response spectra and show you what happened. Here's our original, here's our matched. Check this out. I mean, look now how much the the response spectrum from the time history follows our target response spectrum. You can see that it is, um, we still have that really big flare. Now just for the sake of um, demonstration, watch what happens if I change this tolerance to something much lower, like say 15%. If I do my matching, it's going to take a lot longer because it's, it's going to fudge up the time history a lot more to try to force it to get within that 15% tolerance. I don't think it's going to be able to do it. And the fact that it's taking so long is, is pretty much confirming my hunch. Um, but by the time that little progress bar reaches the end, I think you're going to see that our matching is going to give us a, a weird answer. I, I bet it says that it doesn't converge. But that's okay. We can still use that time history. I think the point is that we're trying to get the, the um, response spectrum to match the target as closely as possible, but at the same time, keeping the time history realistic. Understand that the closer the response spectrum gets to the target, the more the, the time history may be messed up, and the more you're going to have deviations of peaks and weird stuff going on. So you can see it says non-converged. We still got a maximum misfit of 23%. My guess is that's going to be the um, my guess is that that's going to be the uh, right there at the peak of the response spectrum. So let's go ahead and look. There's original matched, original matched. If we compare them, yeah, I mean, those don't look too bad. Let's go ahead and look at the response spectrum. So uh, there's the matched. There's original, there's matched. So you can see, I mean, it, there's really not a big difference. Um, I don't see a big difference at all, in fact. So there's our comparisons, if we're interested. And then, of course, I can go to the table, and I can download the, um, the actual values here for period and acceleration, and I can plot them myself in Excel if I wanted to. To show you kind of how um, easy it can be to do multiple spectral matching, let's go ahead and remove this selected. And um, let's open multiple, and let's just uh, select all three of those time histories. So now if I look at all three of these time histories, I mean, it's just a bunch of gobbledygook, I mean, because they're plotting all the time histories at the same time. And, you know, some may have longer durations than others. I mean, they're just different earthquakes. If I look at response spectra, you can see here are the pre-matched response spectra. So they're kind of all over the place, too. Okay, so to save time, I'm not going to do the um, two-stage matching, though for your homework assignment, I recommend that you do. I'm just going to do a one-stage a spectral match for the entire range of the response spectrum from 0 0.01 to 4 second at a tolerance of 30 percent. So let's go ahead and do the matching and it's going to do uh, one at a time. But this is a really cool feature of this software because um, from my own personal experience I can tell you that doing one at a time is, is a pain. It increases the likelihood of making a mistake and it, um, it's, just, it, it's just a hassle. It is nice to have software that can run in batch mode and, and analyze multiple time histories at once. So uh, while that is processing, um, let's go ahead and maybe talk a little bit about what I expect your outputs for these uh, time history assignments to look like. 
again, I mentioned um, I like to see all of the plots aligned one on top of the other. Acceleration, velocity, time, or displacement, and areas intensity, percent areas intensity and have them all stacked because they all have the same x-axis they all have the same time scale and so it's very nice to be able to uh, look at these things all on top of one another and get an idea of um, how effective your uh, your spectral matching was so if I'm looking at this record here I'm concerned because I, I see for instance uh, deviations of peaks here uh, this one's not too bad this is kind of weird because we have a downward peak where we have an upward peak up here. Same here, same here. Uh, that's a big one. So, you know, right off the bat, I would say, oh boy, this one looks a little iffy. I'm not sure this was a great fit. We really kind of produced a, a different time history than what the original was. If I look at uh, maybe time history number two, here's a, an interesting... So this time history has a uh, directivity pulse. I can tell because it has a big up swing in the velocity followed by a huge downswing right at the front of the velocity record. So uh, let's see, according to these plots, the little dashed line is pre-matching and the black line is post-matching. So this was an example of um, something really nice. We were able to maintain the uh, directivity pulse in our matched record that's good so the matching didn't get rid of it though it diminished the effect of the directivity a little bit but then it does this kind of weird little step thing up here where uh, the original time history has a big swing in it and so I'm not sure that that's a good match check out the uh, what happens to our displacement time history I mean we have big offsets here we have uh, just we've massively changed the displacement time history. Aries intensity doesn't look too bad. I mean, and usually Aries intensity, it, it's okay. You, the thing you're concerned about with Aries intensity is if you see a big change in the run-up early on in the record or later in the record, and so you get deviation. Um, that could be an indication, again, that you, you've fundamentally alter the time history to the point where it's not something that nature produced. Uh, let's go ahead and look at our th uh, a third record here that I plotted from spectral matching. Um, this doesn't look half bad except for this deviation in these peaks here. Um, I'd be pretty concerned about that. Other than that, the peaks seem to line up pretty well. Um, and you can see that that results in this deviation of this of this displacement peak. If that was the only thing wrong, I might be tempted to try to justify this one and keep it. Um, other than that, I think it's uh, it's not too bad. We have another directivity pulse here in this record. It looks like big downswing followed by a big upswing early in the velocity record, uh, and it looks like we were able to maintain that for the most part. We have some weird little loop beady loop things here in the early part of the record I might be a little concerned about or call out, but um, overall not too bad. When you plot your response spectra, I like to plot them all together on one plot like this, and it looks like a mess, but the target is under there, and then I want you to have um, all of the time history, uh, actually all the response spectra from the different records plotted on top of it. And then, when because when you plot it like this, you might see patterns where in, in a, say, a given period range, all the time history seem to dip below the target for some reason. And that's stuff you kind of want to avoid. You want, you want all of your target spectra to kind of even out or, or follow um, if you were to take the mean, for instance, of, of the, all the individual spectra, then you want that to closely match the target, of course. So if all the response spectra are dropping below your target at the same period range, then that's going to be a problem. So that's how you're going to make those types of plots. All right, let's go back and see if we're done yet. Looks like we are. We had two of our records that say they did not converge, and we had one that said that it did. 
So let's go ahead and look at our time histories. Uh, there's our original, there's our matched, original, matched. Man, look at those velocity records. They changed a lot. Let's compare the time histories. So this one, you can compare them one at a time. So there's our first one, not too bad. There's our second one. Um, yep, this is the this is the one where we were talking about had the the velocity pulse and we had the step going up. Uh, so this one looks quite a bit different. I'm not sure I'm a fan of that second record. This third record, again, not too bad with the exception of this deviation in the velocity and this deviation in the displacement. If I look at the response spectra, there's the original. Here is the matched. So you can see it looks like a lot more deviation than we had um, previously, at least if I go back to the this record. Look how everything is a lot tighter right here, right? The reason it's tighter is because I did uh, multiple, uh, multiple rounds of matching and I had a, a tighter tolerance. But when you do that, it also messes up your time histories more. You get more deviations like we're seeing right here. I mean, this is the first time history. And, and when I, when I, if I go over here and I look at the time history for the Duce record, if I look at that, that looks like a really good match, right? The problem is if I go to the response spectrum and I look at the Duce record, uh, let's see. Here is, here's the Dutze record. Look, I mean, does, that's not a very good match at all. You can see that there's big deviations here in the early part of the record, big deviations right through here. I mean, the last part looks fine after one second, but between 0 0.01 and one second, it's a mess. And that's why, folks, we do two rounds of spectral matching instead of just one. So even though the time series look great, I don't see a lot of deviation. If I look at the response spectra, Man, it doesn't look very good. If I look at these response spectra that I developed uh, right here, that match looks a lot better. But in order to get that match, I really had to mess up the time histories. So I think that's a really good demonstration of, you know, the, the more you torture the data, the more you'll get it to comply, but you're going to completely mess it up beyond recognition. So maybe that's the lesson we learned. Anyway, uh, I would go ahead then and go to these time series. I would go to the tables and I would um, download this data, plot them in Excel, and that's how you folks perform spectral matching. Don't forget, you want to do two rounds of spectral matching. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email or come see me in my office. Uh, this takes a little bit of practice to get a more comfortable with spectral matching, but you'll see, I mean, this software really isn't that painful to use, but you have to be careful what you're doing. And, you know, if all else fails, leaving the default values in there are, you'll be pretty safe, okay? Once you start getting into settings though and messing stuff around, that's when it can start doing some really wacky stuff. So anyway, with that, that is uh, the end of our presentation. And I'll go ahead and uh, turn this off. I'll get this uploaded to YouTube so you can see it. Good luck on your homework assignment. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys in class later this, this morning. Thanks.